John Bosnich. Um, he's a Serbian Canadian activist. Is that fair, John? You're also in the media. You've done a lot of things for the Yugoslavian people and, and society. Uh, you're, you're quite active and I'm, I'm really looking forward to getting to know uh, more about you, uh, how you woke up, uh, how you grew up, uh, things you're involved in, in now, and, and we can just take it from there. Welcome, John. Okay. Yep, my pleasure. Um, so I guess the you first... Know, I, I, we can start from the top. I, I was born and grew up in Canada. Um, I did a, I, I, be, I began my school studies in Switzerland. My father had a, my father was a professor of political science and uh, he had a sabbatical leave. So I was fortunate to have my very first year of school studies in Switzerland. And I saw how a, di a direct democracy actually operates. Even at the age of five or six, you can see a difference in the character of the citizens in a country who determine their own fate. Um, and, and I can say that that first influence of living in Switzerland is with me till today. I then I returned to Canada. I lived uh, I lived in the one part of Canada that was bilingual. Uh, the rest of Canada is either unilingual French, that's Quebec, or unilingual English, that's all of the other provinces. I grew up in New Brunswick, Nouveau Brunswick, which is uh, the only officially bilingual province in Canada. So I was fortunate to have a, a bilingual education, and to and to. Um, not only have the bicultural influence of the local population, but coming from an immigrant family, at least on my father's side, and of course my mother, as, as most European origin families, are all immigrants in North America. So I had uh, actually a multicultural background and a bilingual upbringing. Um, my parents were very idealistic people. My father was a political activist himself in his youth and a political, a political science professor and professor of history. And my mother was an activist in the teachers union. She was a, a school teacher and was very active in the union. So I, I came to realize at a very young age that if you decide to, to, to change things, that you can actually do it yourself. You can actually become active and change the environment in which you live and make it a better place. So, um, I, I was active in student politics in high school and so on. And then I really came into my own in university. I went to university in New Brunswick. And um, at first I was studying engineering. I was studying geodesy and cartography in the, in the field of surveying engineering. And I was in that program for a couple of years uh, until an incident occurred on the campus that was kind of a, a political awakening for me. Um, my professor of computer science came to class once and we're, we were a classroom full of engineers and usually engineers don't care too much about the arts, at least not in those days in Canada in the 1970s and 1980s. And the professor was a very civilized and educated man. And he said, is there anybody in the class who would write a letter to the student newspaper? There are about 10,000 people on the campus who as an engineer would object to the closing of the arts center. And my parents had always taken me to the ballet and symphony and so on. And so I wrote that letter. And that letter was what got me involved in politics because the university president summoned me to his office for objecting to the closure of the arts center and asked me how dare I write a letter of opposition and as critical a letter as I had written. And I said, well, I, I did so because I live in a democracy and I believe that I can express my views. And, it, and, and his intervention in my studies led me to run for a representative of the engineers in the student council. And the engineers weren't even represented. They didn't even participate in student government. I came to the student government. I found it out to be a, a totally corrupt club of old boys the sons of, uh, of um, fraternity clubs who had sort of turned it into a private uh, party and uh, dinner club. And so I, I became very active. 
I objected to the way the university controlled the student activities. I created a very strong student union and I stayed on as the student union president for about five years, extending my studies in the university and eventually deciding to leave engineering and to go into political science. From Fredericton, New Brunswick, I graduated and went to Montreal, and I was just starting my studies at McGill University in a master's program when I saw two police beat a man with no reason whatsoever on a public street. So I objected. The police told me to shut up or they were going to arrest me. Well, naturally, that uh, provoked me. So I lay down on the road in front of the police car. And I told them, you're not going to take this guy until I get your names. I got the police officer's names for this brutal beating that they conducted in front of 50 or 60 silent, silent observers on a, on a city street. And the upshot of it was that I, that I ended up uh, getting those police convicted. And when they were convicted, they were the first two police convicted for brutality in the 450 year history of Montreal. And then I started getting death threats. And I went to the prosecutor and the prosecutor told me, John, you're gonna have to leave. I said, what? This is Canada. He said, you're going to have to leave or you may not be alive in 30 days because we've heard the police are gonna get even and there might be an incident and there might be a throw down, a throw down of a gun and you may die. And I said, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll go to, uh, I'll go to New York. It's I can go to New York for a while till it cools down. He said, no, the, the police unions are all connected. You've got to leave the continent. And I recommend not Europe either. And so I went to a friend's wedding in Malaysia. And when he heard about the problem I had, he lent me some money. And I spent the next six months in Asia, traveling up into the Himalayas and so on, where I met other people who had left the West for a variety of reasons. And by meeting them, I made my way to Japan. And it wasn't until I was outside the Western system that I saw really what it was. I could see into the fishbowl and see how it was run and see how corrupt it was. That is bombshell, John. Thank you for sharing that. I, I see here on a Wikipedia page that you were the longest serving elected student union president in North American university history, and you placed seventh in world debating and orator, or, oratorical championships. I wouldn't want to get in an argument with you, John. <laughs> well, you know, it's not that I can speak on any subject. But if you get me speaking on a matter of principle or on a matter of justice or on a matter of human rights or ethnic rights or cultural rights, then it would be a tough debate. And it's not because I'm a good speaker. It's because I actually believe in the things that I say. And that, you know, debating in universities and things like the Oxford Union and so on, they flip a coin and you get either side of the debate. And you debate, you debate either side, whichever one comes up. If you go into politics, you end up debating the things that you really believe in. It's a totally different ball game, to put it in North American context. And uh, once I became active, I couldn't stop. I ran for mayor of my provincial capital when I was 22 and got 36% of the vote. The three federal parties supported one candidate for the first time in history to stop me. And after I put the police in prison, after the police were convicted, then I, I, I left actually for Asia. And when I, when I was in Asia, I made my way to Japan. And in Japan, I was very fortunate to find my way by chance into the media. And then when I got into the media, I had access to information. And the more I read and the more I learned, the more I discovered how totally corrupt this world is. A lot of people feel the same way, and a lot of people have taken different paths to get there. Uh, social media and the alternative media has opened so many doors. They're cross-linking and cross-fertilizing different minds and sources and experiences together. Thanks for being part of that, and thanks for leading the way, uh, John. 
you've got some more experiences to share. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about Bobby Fischer and how that ties in with the Yugoslavian bombing campaign? Well, that it, yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's very interesting the way the way life pans out. I was uh, I was working in Japan. I, I planned to go to Japan just until things cooled off with the police in Montreal, but um, it 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 ended up that uh, the trip to Japan turned out to be a life opportunity. I went I went over there. I got into the media, working in the media at NHK, which is the Japanese national broadcaster, the the public broadcaster of Japan. I started working in the World English Language Shortwave Radio Service and later the Satellite Television Service. And the more access to information I got, the more I became interested in trying to figure out how the world got the way it is. Nobody would choose to set things up the way they are now. Absolutely not. Uh, a few oligarchs running most countries. The oligarchs own the media. The media serves the military. The military makes the wars to make good media material. I, I just posted something on one of the social media today. It's a year ago today that I made a comment debunking the claimed use of poison by President Assad of Syria. And today he's accused again of the exact same offense by the exact same accusers who are lying again. There's no reason for the president of a country with a massive, effective army to use poison gas when he has tanks, rockets, airplanes, rifles, and soldiers, all of whom know their job. Just as this crazy, alleged uh, uh, Skripal poisoning in England. Look, if President Putin wanted a double agent dead, that double agent would be dead now. It's as simple as that. And he certainly wouldn't be killed with a poison that has a signature that says, <laughs> with, uh, from Russia with love on it. You couldn't invent something more foolish and more childish if you were writing for kids, kindergarten readers. Nobody would do this. But for one reason or another, the Secret Services of England think that they can pin this on the Russian government and pin it on Putin himself. I saw a funny joke where they said they found President Putin's passport at the site of where Skripal was poisoned. <laughs> of course, why not? If you're going to lie, why not make it a big lie? So the, 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 the amazing thing is that normal people, that you and I and, and everybody we know, runs into in their daily life, the person you go to the, the shopping center with, or the, the person standing in line in the post office in front of you, that many of your average normal people continuously fall for the lie. Why? I think it's because we don't have the time to think. I think our world is designed to eat up all of our time with the rat race to make us run like gerbils on the running wheel so that we don't have the moment needed to think, to give us CNN repeating the same story every 15 to 20 minutes, brainwashing us and completely censoring the other point of view. And all you need to do is sit back and say, if I were the perpetrator, if I were the alleged criminal who did this, would I do this this way? Of course not. Why would I use a poison that would be pointing back at me? I would never do that. And, 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 and the, the thing that makes it so crazy is that, the, is that the chemical weapons laboratory run by England is only a few kilometers away from the site. And inside that chemical, chemical weapons lab, they have samples of the very poison accusing that they're accusing Russia of using. Too much, too stupid, too lowbrow, even for the overworked common man. And it's all like that. Now we have the story about the reuse of the poisons in Syria. 
We have a world which is run by people who think, I, I wouldn't even say they think, they know we're stupid. They know that they've so buried us in a boring, monotonous life that they can pepper us with lies and we're going to sneeze every time. And that, unfortunately, is the way the world is run. And we have continuing incidents of the United States and the NATO powers and the New World Order starting wars in Ukraine, in Syria, literally invading Libya and murdering the leader of the country in cold blood. And then afterwards having the audacity of saying that the aggressor and the danger to the world is President Putin of Russia. Or now, of course, soon we'll be hearing that it's China. We live in a very poorly constructed theater of the absurd. And we have a responsibility. I have children. I have a responsibility to my children to make it a better, more honest place to live. That doesn't matter if I'm living here in Serbia at the time, or if I'm back in Canada, or if I'm in Tokyo, where I spent almost 20 years. Wherever you go, the narrative is a lie. And it's a and it's a an intentional fabrication. Because by fabricating reality, by making a fake world for us to live in, those who run things run in the real world. They take the resources, they take the money, they print the currencies in any amounts that they want, and we work hard for the toilet paper that they call the US dollar or whatever it else whatever it else whatever else it is that they're compensating us with so i think that we have the very very great good fortune of living in the era of the internet in which you tate and i can connect to each other and you can ask me this question we've never met before this is our first discussion and I can guess that we're 90% online on the same topic without ever having met. And that's because the internet is helping us to free ourselves from the monopoly media, what even President Trump calls the lying mainstream media. Could you even imagine tape 20 years ago, the president of the United States calling CNN, CBS, and NBC, and ABC the lying mainstream media? He'd be no. done in a minute. He'd be, he'd be burned alive. He'd be burned like Joan of Arc. Those days are over. We've got a world today in which if you look and if you use your eyes and you use your mind, you can spot things and you can share your observations with others who will have the same thoughts. And once we work together, we can change it. That's the main reason why we're here. Change it for the better. Well, that's right, John. Well said. Uh, you've encapsulated the problem. You've encapsulated the solution. And we're in process uh, with both running alongside each other the problem hopefully will run out of gas and the solution will hopefully, with our help, uh, pick up steam. Well, I, I think it's, it's, it's only with our help. It's only when people start to say, you know, Tate, I used to work in Japan at the peak of the Japanese bubble economy. I worked at up to six different media houses at the same time as a foreign expert. On a good month there... I could clear in pocket, I don't know if it sounds like a big amount now, but at that time it was an immense amount of money. It was over 45,000 euros per month after tax in my pocket. And I chose to leave that place because I found in the end that I was facilitating the system. I no longer want to be an editor of facts that I haven't checked myself. I don't want to be a reader of news written for me by somebody at the bottleneck in New York 
at AFP or at AP or at Reuters. I would like to see what there is in the world. And if I'm lucky enough to be the person who's there on the scene to take a photo of it, to ask the participants to tell the world what really happened here. And to change it to a world in which it's not the mainstream media, but it's a human being telling another human being exactly what they saw and proving it. So that we can work together and share information at the human one-to-one -one level. And then if we know the information is correct, then we'll really have entered the information age, this so-called age of Aquarius. I'm an Aquarius born in a, the, the month of February. If we could really enter this age in the manner in which we're supposed to, in a manner in which I'm empowered, you're empowered, and the people who listen to us speak are empowered, then we can participate in a power shift, in a power transfer, a transfer of power from the state, a transfer of power from the mega corporations and the multinationals, a transfer of power from the oligarchs, a transfer of power from all of those entities and from the lying mainstream media into the hands of individuals who fully informed and fully empowered with information can make a new course for humanity. That's what I think our generation is here to do. Not to make ourselves rich. Not to be a star on YouTube. Not to take selfies somewhere in the Alps on the latest, uh, you know, most expensive pair of skis or driving a Lamborghini in Hollywood. But to actually be able to say to your children that I have two sons, to be able to say to your children, boys, I think I've made the place a little bit better than it was when I arrived. And now it's up to you to keep it going, to keep on making it better. We each have a supercomputer in our hands. Any smartphone today is more powerful than the biggest computer in the world in the 1950s. Maybe now in the 1960s. And if we use these devices to augment our information, to augment our perceptions of the world around us, we're no longer going to be limited to the senses that God gave us in our bodies. But we'll start to have something that I studied in engineering, which is called remote sensing. Through your device, through your computer, through your phone, I can see something I could never see because I can't be everywhere at the same time. So if we continue to expand this network and we continue to give firsthand information to each other, my eyes can be where you are. Your ears can be where I am. Our senses can span the globe and we can build a living biocomputer of persons sensing for each other and then using our minds together to make a better solution. That's how I see all of this translating in the end. Wow. That was very powerful. Thank you very much, John Bosnich. That was fantastic. I'd like to uh, end it here, and I'd like to um, uh, allow people a chance to reach you. If someone is interested to understand your thoughts on a regular basis, geopolitically or uh, per personally, professionally, whatever the case might be, how do they find you? Well, they can email me. I mean, I, I get seven or 800 emails a day, so that's not a certainty. But you can email me at jbosnich at gmail.com. So J-B-O-S-N-I-T-C-H at gmail.com. Or you can find me on Facebook. Uh, you can friend me or you can follow me or send me a message on Facebook. Um, you can reach me on Viber or on WhatsApp. 
I mean, my telephone number, I think it's on Facebook, but it's uh, country code 381-63-152-4478. That's the country is uh, Serbia. And that number floats with me wherever I go. And if you have, um, if you have a problem that you think is important, I mean, not just a question of money or a question of a business that isn't working, but a real issue and you need help, I'd be very happy to help because uh, through the experiences that I've lived, I think I have a little bit of a different way of solving problems. Bobby Fisher was arrested in Japan for playing chess in the former Yugoslavia. He was hunted down by the U.S. State Department and he was arrested on the orders of the U.S. President. And when the U.S. President gets somebody arrested in an allied country, they always get their man. They always get extradited. They always get processed and sent back to the United States. Well, it just so happened that on the day that Bobby Fischer was arrested, I was on air at Radio Japan World Service at three in the morning, and I got the ticker tape of the first ever news of that event. And as soon as I saw that, I thought, you know what? Somehow fate brought this story to me. I was a chess player. And through my father, I was of Serbian descent. And here's a man being arrested for playing chess in Serbia. And he was my hero, Bobby Fischer. And from that moment, I engaged myself. I found out where he was. I went to the jail in the airport, in Tokyo's Narita Airport. I met Bobby. He thought I was a CIA agent or an FBI agent. I had to convince him that I wasn't. And then I had to somehow convince a Japanese judge to recognize me as a lawyer, even though I'm not, I did. I then defended Bobby and it took nine and a half months and we got Bobby out of jail and he is the first man that the United States did not get. And when we then got Bobby asylum in Iceland, the country where he won the World Chess Championship in 1972 and he lived out his days in Iceland and he died in Iceland he died a peaceful death of natural causes in Iceland. And then even after he was dead, the deep state and the U.S. government came after his money that he had won. And I had to go back to Iceland and I had to go back there on a on, literally on a second's notice to speak to the Supreme Court of Iceland and get them to stop the effort to steal Bobby's inheritance that he left to his Japanese wife. And we won. We freed Bobby. We got his inheritance to his wife and we slapped the deep, state, the deep state twice, once on each cheek. And I think they remember it till today. And it cost me a lot of effort and I don't regret it for a second because I'm a believer in God, but you don't have to be a believer in God. You're here on this planet for a reason. You have capacities that somehow came to be yours. If you don't use them for others, they're going to die with you. Unused, wasted. That's the way I see it. Thank you very much, uh, John. Um, inspiring. Um, where, did, where do you go from, from there? Um, would you well, come back I, on to um, discuss political views uh, periodically as current events break. Um, it's one of those open offers that you're welcome to take up at any time. I'd be, ha I'd be happy. Anytime you want to give me a call, Tate, uh, you can. You know, you might know I do commentaries for RT frequently. Yeah. I've been on, I, I was on CNN, I was on NBC, I was on ABC, I was on CBS. But when I wasn't towing the line, when I wasn't, um, you know, applauding the NATO bombing of Serbia like a trained duck or a trained penguin, whatever it is that they get to applaud. That was the last I saw of the mainstream media. And you know what I say to that? Good riddance. Good riddance to rubbish. Good riddance to the lying mainstream media that censors you the minute you say something that's not a part of their pre-scripted narrative. I've seen CNN operate in the field and lie right in front of the evidence. 
I remember when uh, when NATO bombers bombed a caravan of Albanian refugees. And the first reports out said that mach- that they had been machine gunned by the Serbs. I got down there just a number, just three or four hours after those first lying reports came out. And I found, along with two other journalists, a piece of a bomb saying, made in Pittsburgh, USA, with the date on it. And we held it up and we showed it to the camera. We found the name, the model of the bomb. And that was the end of the lie. There's only one way to fight the lies, and that is the truth. And to find the truth is 10 times harder than to tell a lie. It's a, it's a, you could call it a corollary on the, the old saying, it takes a whole lot of water to wash out a tiny spot of mud. It takes a whole lot of truth to wash out even the tiniest lie. And what we need now is we need a generation of young people who are willing to fight for the truth and to get the truth in print and to get it on the internet and to confront the lies with the truth immediately, not six months later, but the same day. If we do that, we're going to live in a different world. And it's for all of us. So why not do it? Well, the signal is out, John. The signal has been broadcast, and you've been doing it for a long time. And here's another transmission uh, calling all people who have a heart and have a desire to fulfill their destiny, find their mission, be the best that they can be. Uh, You've heard it from John. He put it more eloquently than I've ever heard it in my lifetime, uh, probably because he's lived it from so many different ways. Thanks, John, for sharing. That is fantastic. I'll include all the links to this video and you're welcome uh, again. And I can't think of a better person that I'd had my first interview with to start off this series to inspire me and everyone listening uh, about how, what we can do to this corrupt and uh, very dangerous world that, that even, even brings us towards world war three on a pack of lies through the most ridiculous pattern of, inventing reasons to make war, then making war, then stealing resources, then blaming the attack attacked country for all the devastation that has happened. It's absolutely absurd, beyond absurd. It's, it's suicidal. And how do you, uh, what do you do? I think the only thing we can do is what you said, John, and that's the most powerful thing. Although it seems weak, together we are the most powerful together. I appreciate you doing this, Tate, and uh, please send me the link. I'll share it over the social media that I'm connected to, and I hope that others will share it as well. Good luck with your project, and please call me anytime. Um, I try to keep abreast of what's going on, and I try to get my, uh, my hands on original sources, on people who have not been asked, but who have the answers. Okay. Well, there you go. Uh, Original sources come to me and I'll interview you. All I require is access to your public profile and to know as much about you as I can in terms of your views going back a number of years. Once I have that, we're we're on. Thanks a lot. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Tate. And good luck with your project.